Tonight is Samsung launching its own mobile payment system. Twitter considers using autoplay on videos, and a jury reaches a verdict in the iTunes lawsuit. Tech News Tonight is next. This is Twit. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 236 for Tuesday, December 16th, 2014. This episode is brought to you by ZipRecruiter. ZipRecruiter makes hiring faster, easier, and cheaper. Post your job to over 50 job boards with just one click. Try ZipRecruiter with a free four-day trial now at ZipRecruiter.com slash TN2. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash TN2. Hello, everyone. I'm Sarah Lane, and let's get right into the tech feed. Recode is reporting that Samsung is in talks with payment startup LoopPay, based in Boston, Massachusetts, to launch a wireless mobile payment system in 2015 that would rival Apple Pay and others. This is according to multiple sources. Now, even though the deal reportedly isn't done, a prototype of the payment system working on a Samsung phone has reportedly been created already. Samsung's latest Galaxy phone also includes fingerprint identification technology, which could be incorporated into a new payment system, whatever it may be. Now, as for LoopPay, the company's technology can wirelessly transmit the same information that's stored on either a debit or a credit card's magnetic stripe to a store's checkout equipment without swiping a card, though through something called magnetic secure transmission that's baked into hardware products that it sells directly to consumers, dongles and stuff like that. Now, speaking of Apple Pay, Apple announced today that it signed up dozens more banks and retail stores and even startups to adopt Apple Pay, which allows customers to buy things using their iPhones. USAA, TD Bank North America, and Commerce Bank all support Apple Pay now, along with new retailers like Staples and chain grocery stores like Winn-Dixie and Albertsons. Even Amway Center, you might know that is the place that the Orlando Magic basketball team plays, will start accepting Apple Pay at at least some of its food and beverage stands during games. Forrester Research predicts overall mobile payments volume reaching $142 billion by 2019, with Apple Pay accounting for $34 billion in e-commerce volume in the United States in the next four years. That's a lot. Speaking of Apple, Apple has halted online sales of its products in Russia due to what the company calls extreme ruble fluctuations. Russia's currency, if you've been following, has been quite volatile. It lost as much as 19% of its value today, despite a surprise interest rate increase from the Russian government. Apple previously had dealt with the ruble's fluctuations by increasing the price of the iPhone 6 by 25%. In Russia, and that's all online. The online store is Apple's real only direct interface with Russian consumers since the company doesn't have any of its own stores, retail stores anyway, in the country. To autoplay or not to autoplay? That is the question that Twitter faces when it comes to videos on its social networking service. Facebook already does this. Some of us are quite used to it, right? But sources tell Adweek that Twitter, employees at Twitter anyway, are split internally over whether this is the best move for Twitter's own users. Now, the company bought Snappy TV earlier this year, and it also has its Amplify ad program, which leans very heavily on video. It's allowed Twitter to partner with sports and entertainment brands like the NFL and the Oscars to sell sponsorships on videos. But since Facebook launched Autoplay earlier this year, it's been gaining in numbers against YouTube, in views anyway. In September, Facebook said it was showing 1 billion views per day. That sounds like a lot, but Adweek sources say that that figure has already grown to 3 billion. Also on the Twitter front, starting today, the company is introducing two new ad features. The first lets advertisers target tw Twitter users on particular wireless carriers. Another lets them reach users on new mobile devices. So the carrier-based targeting would be available to all Twitter marketers, Through the though the feature will largely be useful for carriers to promote device upgrades and loyalty services to customers. An executive who decided not to want to be named, tells Adweek that Twitter has tested carrier targeting over recent months with multiple wireless companies, all the four biggest in the U.S., along with some international carriers as well. Now, as for new mobile device users, the way it works is going forward, if a Twitter user logs in using a new device, say I buy a new, I don't know, Galaxy Note, advertisers could now pitch me on other apps. Both Google and Facebook already offer this feature as well. Okay, let's talk about lawsuits and yeah, we're going to go back to Apple for that. And joining me, I'm not going to do this alone, is Renee Ritchie of iMore.com and, of course, MacBreak Weekly every week here on Twit. Hey, Renee. 
Hey, Sarah, great to be back. Well, great to have you. So this is, we've talked about the case, which is which is ongoing involving uh, Apple, making it difficult for people who bought music somewhere other than iTunes to play that music on their iPods. This case was a decade old, 10 years in the making, but the trial only lasted about a week. So what what happened? It, uh, you know, it, it was really interesting because it was a decade old and then it got to court. And one of the strangest things that happened was they looked around and had a really hard time finding a plaintiff because it only affected certain eras of iPods. And it turned out one of the plaintiffs hadn't bought an iPod during that time. Then another receipt was produced, but it was a husband's law company that actually bought it and not the plaintiff. And I think at one point they were out on the streets basically screaming and yelling and barking for anyone with an iPod to please come into the courtroom. Yeah, so there was... There was two major plaintiffs, and you know the Apple was facing damages, a lot of damages, maybe somewhere between three hundred fifty million to one billion if it lost. Of course, Apple notoriously has pretty great lawyers, but there there were those reports that okay, you had to have purchased an iPod between I think two thousand six and two thousand nine, as you mentioned. One of the plaintiffs can't really prove that she bought one of these iPods. It's tied to her husband's company, and that doesn't really work. So if there were over 8 million people who bought iPods during this time, where are they all? Why don't, why don't they want to try to get some money out of Apple? Yeah, Leo said it great earlier today. Where it's, you know, it's, this is a lot about the lawyers. If this was a real case, a, Apple Apple really has no dog in the DRM game. They, Steve Jobs famously wrote that letter uh, where he thought it would be a better experience for everybody if music went DRM free. But the record labels really wanted DRM. At their core, they believe that a lot of us are thieves and that iPods was were basically large hard drives that people could use to steal music with. And they their deals with Apple contractually forced Apple to protect that music. And they, at the minute that iTunes DRM was cracked, there was a clock tick. Uh, and Apple had to fix that crack or they would face losing all that music. And when you look at it, yes, it'd be nice if real networks could, you know, fake um, fair play DRM and get on the iPod as well. But faking iTunes DRM and someone hacking or cracking iTunes DRM are the same thing when it comes to Apple's contract. It was just, it was an ill-aimed, ill-targeted lawsuit to begin with. So Apple's position that really all it wanted to do was protect the consumers um, and also, you know, keep us from buying things from competitors. How do you feel about that position? I mean, how does how true does that hold with you? Or is it just, this is just classic Apple, especially in the earlier days of digital music, just trying to control the whole thing? Yeah, I think it really comes down to Apple. I mean, Apple believes down to their core that they need to control an experience. And historically, it's the things they don't control. For example, AT&T's signal or, you know, uh, delivery services. Uh, all of those things with, that we complain about, those are outside of Apple's purview. And, you know, they did provide, even with the Real Networks case, you could always buy Real Networks music or buy Microsoft Plays for Share Music, burn it to a CD, then rip that into iTunes and upload it. And yes, it was complicated, but it was a way to move your music around. What's really complicated is trying to either license other DRM or license out your DRM because that only makes your software more difficult. It makes managing the entire system in keeping with those record company contracts more difficult. It, it would create a, probably a worse product. Why did this take 10 years if it was so qu su su such a quick deliberation for the jury? See, that's the interesting thing because the jury, I don't I don't think they were even out for four hours. It was, <laughs> it was rapid and the judge helped that a little bit by bifurcating the decision where she said that you first have to look at iTunes 7.0 and decide, did it give good features? You know, it did provide video. It did provide thumbnail for album view. It did a lot of things besides uh, taking away the the the, DR, the the hack DRM support for real networks, uh, and they found that yes, this this software did provide additional value. So they they therefore couldn't even get to the stage of saying that it was either anti-competitive or against consumer consumer interests. It reminds me a little bit of the early days of the Palm Pre, where Palm would sort of hack the USB, and then the next day Apple would issue an iTunes patch and fix it. It's <laughs> one of those little cat and mouse games. Do you think that there's an appeal situation here? Future class action lawsuits. You know, if they can drum up some more plaintiffs over the millions of people who supposedly could be affected, uh, or have we heard the end of this? No, I, I think they're absolutely, I mean, it, uh, it's the court system. There are, there always can be appeals. It, it depends, you know, if the, I guess, and I hate saying this, I guess if the lawyers feel that they could get more money, if they could, if they could drive more income from it, they'll most likely be appeals. Uh, we, we were looking at the Apple ebook trial at the same time. And w 
Apple has a lot of money, but Apple will settle cases when they believe that they are right, whether whether they actually are right or not. But when they, as a company and their executives, believe that they're in the right, they will spend those hundreds of billions of dollars to fight these cases. And they would much rather be proven right than just save a few money in the court, a few dollars at the courts. Renee Ritchie is our friend over at iMore.com, and of course, one of the regular hosts of MacBreak Weekly, which airs on Tuesdays at. 11 a.m. Pacific time? Is that right? That's Absolutely. right. Yes. See? Nailed it. And I, sometimes I'm even on the show, so yeah, yeah, really nailed it. Thanks for being with us, Renee, and uh, remind folks where they can keep up with you besides iMore. You've got your own podcast. You're all over the place. Yeah, sure. I mean, you can find me uh, at Renee Ritchie on Twitter. That's the best place. I put everything there. But I do a, a podcast called Debug for Developers, Iterate for Designers, and Vector for how this technology affects all of us humans. Well, aren't you a show off? Thanks so much for being <laughs> on our show. Thank you, Sarah. Coming up, is Bose prepping for a new music streaming service? Hmm, kind of a crowded market already, isn't it? And 3D printed legs help little legs run. And there are four of them. That's all I'm going to say for a few minutes anyway. But first, if you are hiring for your company, well, congratulations. I'm glad that you're growing your team. But obviously, you only want to find the best candidates and hire the best people, right? Posting your job in just one place that's not really the right way to go about it because you're not going to find all these quality candidates who are using all sorts of job boards and you know, you, maybe you'll never meet each other and you miss out. Cast a wide net and then you never have to wonder, oh, maybe there was somebody better. I should have spent more time. You don't have any time, right? That's where ZipRecruiter comes in. It helps you post to 50 plus job sites. That's Craigslist and LinkedIn and Twitter, but it's just one click. So you, you, you have much less work to do overall. You post once and the qualified candidates roll into ZipRecruiter's interface, which is very easy to use. No more juggling emails or people calling your office and you're, you know, you're now it's a full-time job. You're just screening your candidates. It's quick. You rate them and you can hire the right person as fast as possible. Find out today why ZipRecruiter has been used by over 250,000 businesses. Obviously, they're doing something right. Right now, viewers and listeners of TN2 can try ZipRecruiter. In fact, for a free four-day trial, just go to ZipRecruiter.com slash TN2. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash TN and the number two. And we thank ZipRecruiter for their support of Tech News Tonight. On to a few more stories that we're following today. All right, let's get to this Bose story. Bose, of course, is an audio manufacturer. I love their headphones. Apparently, they're about to launch their own streaming service, reports HypeBot, and that the company is moving quickly to build and launch its platform, according to sources. Now, Apple, which owns Beats Music, currently features Bose products in its online and retail stores, but it wasn't long ago that it had temporarily pulled Bose products from its stores, at least for a time. Could this be related? VentureBeat points out that Bose is currently seeking a job, speaking of jobs, the senior user experience designer of cloud music services. And the description of that job says that the ideal candidate will have worked at Apple's Beats Music, Pandora, Spotify, or Google Play, or similar. So all signs point to... Sounds like maybe. Sony Pictures Entertainment got its first employee lawsuit since the massive computer breach that exposed the personal information of thousands of its staff members. This was inevitable. Lawyers representing two former Sony's Pictures employees filed a class action lawsuit in federal court in Los Angeles today, alleging that Sony was negligent in ignoring warnings that its computer system was prone to attack. Hackers calling themselves the Guardians of Peace began releasing sensitive data after the security breach first became public on November 24th. The breach is expected to cost Sony Pictures at least tens of millions of dollars, not only to repair its computer network, but also to conduct a forensic investigation of the attack and then pay these possibly impending legal fees. Sony has already offered employees identity protection services through a third-party provider for a year, but that might not be enough. Some employees also received threatening emails on December 5th, claiming to be from the same hacking group, asking employees to sign a statement disassociating themselves with Sony or risks danger to themselves and their families. Also back in November, Senator Al Franken requested more information about privacy policies at writing sharing service Uber. I don't even know what to call Uber anymore. We talk about it every day though, right? Based on reports, of course, that the company spied on specific writer whereabouts. 
Now, today, the company responded, they were supposed to by the end of the year, by repeating that employees can only access rider information for legitimate business purposes and that the media generated misperceptions about how Uber uses consumer data. Now, addressing a specific case, Uber claims that an employee did access a journalist's account information, but only did so because that journalist was running 30 minutes late to a meeting. Uber also says that it scaled back access to what's known as its God view function. So only employees in operations or other areas like fraud prevention can use it. God view allows Uber to see where all of its cars and all of its riders are at any given time. Senator Franken says that he is concerned by the response and will continue pressing for answers. Okay, I've been waiting the entire show for this. Finally, we talk a lot about the potential for 3D printing. You know, you can uh, print uh, replacement parts or clothing, even organs getting there anyway. How about puppy prosthetics? A dog who goes by the name of Derby happened to have been born with disfigured legs. He wasn't able to walk or run or do doggy stuff. Instead of a common wheel rig that many animals use, but, you know, it was kind of a clunky situation, printing company 3D Systems built some leg prosthetics that allowed Derby to actually run. And, you know, he's doing good. Go, Derby, go. If that does not warm your cold little black heart, nothing will. And that is it for this edition of Tech News Tonight. So happy. Subscribe to the show at twit.tv slash TN2. Write us with feedback at TN2 at twit.tv. And watch us live every weekday, if you can, at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern. Don't miss our morning news show. That's Tech News Today, tomorrow and every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. We will see you then. I'm Sarah Lane, and thanks for watching. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by Cashfly.com. Hi, this is Leo Laporte, and if you'd like to help us design our new website, I invite you to visit twit.to slash navtest. We've got eight quick questions we'd like to ask you that will help us make the navigation easier to use. That's twit.to slash navtest. Thanks a lot.